Mm. All right, we'll try it again. Okay. This is Wolfcast number 12. <laughs> and today we have uh, Steven Skeena with us today. And he is a world-renowned uh, professor in AI. He is the new director of the um, AI Institute that just came about, right? Right. Um, he has three books, at least that I know of. He has more, I think 12 books in total. Yeah. Six, six books. Six, six books. books. Yeah. And the, it's the Algorithm Design Manual, Data Science Design Manual, uh, Calculated Betting. Right. Um, I really like the Data Science Design Manual. That one is that one's very good. I like it, Thank like you. it a lot. Um, I haven't taken a look at the algorithm one yet, but that one seems really interesting. So isn't it a bestseller on Amazon? That is a popular book. Uh, a lot of people use it to interview uh, for interview prep when you're interviewing at Google. Mm. So if let's say when you're uh, going for a, a uh, high tech interviews these days, they people definitely want to people that generally ask algorithm questions, mm. and my book is kind of very good for brushing up on your algorithm so that you're you're ready for that. Mm. Um, and yeah, so we're going to talk about a lot of stuff about AI today. Now, first thing I want to know is what got you into this industry? Like, I know what I got, got, how I got myself into sort of data science and stuff, but I really like to hear when, you know, people are, you know, renowned, how they got into it. Well, my, my original work was in, in algorithms, actually, which is more theoretical computer science, which is not really a data intensive field. Um, but over the years, when kind of probably when the Human Genome start Project started, or you know around you know probably around the turn of the century, um, suddenly it there were a lot of stuff with biological data became very exciting, mm -hmm. and I, I got interested in problems in bioinformatics revolving around larger amounts of data, and this got me into you know you know eventually from transitions uh, you know you know working on different things, um, from working on Sequence data, one area of sequence data is text, and I started getting interested in text analysis and text mining, and that's kind of gotten me into the, you know, kind of the, the type of stuff that I'm doing today. Yeah, do you do any uh, um, things with like reinforcement learning? Like those agents kind of thing? I don't particularly work on reinforcement. A lot of what we do is related to, you know, use machine learning. I would say mostly applied machine learning. Um, we don't uh, in my lab, we haven't done any reinforcement learning, but that's obviously an interesting and important area, and uh, it wouldn't be surprising if we end up slithering into that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. How exactly are you using the machine learning in a biological application? Well, okay, so in, in biology, um, so first of all, machine learning is a very general technology, and um, it's used for, um, you know, typically a lot of pattern recognition kinds of problems. And, you know, when you have examples of things that you have labeled, and let's say you'd like to, typically, a, a typical thing that we would like to use machine learning for is for building classifiers, things that recognize and assign a label to something. Yeah. In biology, a classic problem might be to identify what is a gene. Okay, so you have a, a genome sequence. Part of that is describes genes. Some of it is just junk or you don't know what it is. You'd like to ascribe these features. A, one approach to building these kind of classification systems is machine learning, mm -hmm. where you take a bunch of examples, you label them, you use some you know, various, other mach various machine learning technologies. Um, these days, l neural networks and, and deep learning are very, very popular. So, so what happens when you don't have enough examples? Because like one instance in case of the genome is... I don't know how much data they actually have on that, and how do you get over that? Because it's also the genes are you know, very, very, very long, and you have very few of the whole gene you know, sequences. So how do you, I don't know, train the algorithms and still get... Uh, so, what so what drives, obviously what drives machine learning these days is data. And so obviously the more data you have, the better. Um, what's also true is, though, that, that there's often a mix between what I will say Sometimes you have a lot of unlabeled data, what we call unlabeled data, and a little modest amount of labeled data. Labeled data is when a person has looked at it and tells you what it is, like says, this is a gene. Mm -hmm. Unlabeled data might be just raw sequence coming off of, you know, raw sequence. You know, GenBank contains 
you know, billions of bases of raw sequence data. And you can imagine sometimes using um, unsupervised learning techniques. You can try to build models and feature collection and features out of the unlabeled data in an automatic way where it benefits from a large amount of this stuff. And once you have this, you can get away then with a little bit of the, the labeled stuff. Mm -hmm. So you, 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 you build a big model on, on, on the big data that you have that provides good features so that you can get away with less training data mm -hmm. on the, you know, that requ this requires supervision. Yeah. So you mentioned unsupervised learning. One, one of the things that confuses me, and I think many people nowadays, is just the general class of like AI. Like people say, oh, how can I solve the problem? Oh, I'll just throw some AI at it and I'll solve the problem. It's right, like, what right, exactly right. What does that mean? What are the different classifications? What problems are these techniques meant for and which ones are they not meant for? Okay, so if I, th if I were to, again, you know, what, what definitions are in any fast-moving field is, you know, it, it changes. But um, AI is kind of an old field. It goes back to the 1950s of trying to build machines that did things that seemed like they required intelligence. Mm -hmm. And this has, you know, has a long tradition. And part of the problem is that once you, a lot of things that, seemed like they required intelligence. You know, once you figured out how to do them, suddenly they don't look so smart anymore. An example of this might have been like computer chess. You know, that, that the early days of, of AI involved things like computer chess and building a rob you know, bu building computer chess systems or trying to understand natural language or, try, you know, and some of these challenges turned out to be relatively easy and could be solved. Well, not, some, of them, some of them, maybe not, some of them were, were easy and solved quickly and were impressive, things like expert systems, mm -hmm. some of which took longer to figure out, like, you know, computer chess and things like this, but in ways that, that didn't seem to require, when you looked at how the computer chess programs play, they didn't seem to be playing like people, and it didn't really tell you that much about intelligence. Yeah. The more, more recently, the big progress that's happened in AI has been through something called machine learning, which are algorithms that take large amounts of data, and instead of kind of being told rules by a programmer, they instead are kind of learning what they can, looking for patterns in the data, and, using, and, and inferring these patterns. And um, this is where the progress has, has kind of been made. Mm -hmm. And so machine learning has kind of taken over you know, what people traditionally call areas of AI, like language processing and computer vision and things like that. Mm -hmm. So now, also, some of the things I, I see a lot is people everywhere kind of seeing the progress that's happening. Like, let's say with AlphaGo, with Google. Yes. They see, you know, this machine beating a, a world champion at this very, very, very complicated game that requires so many moves and how could it possibly, you know, right. beat this player? So then people begin to think and it's like, well, I can let my imagination run wild as to how it's doing that. And since general terms are flying around, just like machine learning and AI, right. people start to think that it's much more capable of doing stuff that it really can't yet. Right. You know, like, like actually acting like humans. People are worried, oh, it's going to take over the world. So how do those perceptions come about, and how can they be sort of fixed? You know, how do you explain? To okay, so there are a couple happens? different questions. First of all, I was saying that that computer chess seemingly didn't say too much about intelligence. This was true at the point where computer chess, you know, like when Gary Kasparov, first the world champion, first lost to a computer chess program. Mm -hmm. This chess program worked in a way that were based on brute force and based on rules that kind of that had been taught from, you know, from, from that program, um, which was, okay, goodness, Deep Blue, okay, yeah. was not, um, you know, didn't say too much about intelligence. Now, once machine learning has come along, this AlphaGo project is quite a, a different beast. This is one where um, it kind of has learned how to play chess by itself without, in some sense, chess and Go, more, more prominently Go. But basically, um, 
kind of from scratch, basically playing games against itself using that technique called reinforcement learning that you talk about, kind of was able to teach itself how to play chess and, t and, and go and do it at a level above any other person or computer on Earth. So that's actually an amazing thing. Mm -hmm. um, now, the question and, and you know, the techniques that they're using there are certainly interesting techniques that, that you know, are being potentially applicable to, to other intelligent systems. So that's, that's a very good thing. The second part of what you're asking has to do with what are the kind of fears of AI? What should people expect that AI does? Mm -hmm. And generally speaking, if I had to make a distinction, the modern machine learning slash AI systems are very good at percept what I would say perceptual tasks. There's certain things that, that, that you do fairly instantly when you look at it. When, 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 when your grandmother walks in the room, you recognize this in, you know, in, in a flash, okay? Or driving a car. Driving a car is not a process of incredible amounts of learning, or it, it's something you, you, you sort of do fairly mechanically. It's kind of, you know. So these kind of perceptual tasks seem to be something that computers can do very, very well given enough data, okay? And that's kind of been one of the, the big insights from this whole deep learning thing. Now, then there are, the question is about higher level cognitive tasks. You know, you'd like to, you know, writing books, you know, um, you know, m m you know asking interesting questions at a podcast, okay? All kinds of higher level yeah, things. Exactly. These seem to be things that are harder for computers to do. Now, um, you know, certainly with the current technologies. Um, and, you know, making music is an interesting counterexample. There, there do exist systems that compose music. Yeah. There, there do exist systems that seemingly have trained on, for example, lots of, of Bach music and Absolutely. produce an artificial, can, can make new compositions in the scheme of that. Yeah. What's funny is that I, I saw one doing that, and it was like playing for like five minutes, and then you start playing the same note over and over again. Okay, so, you know, so there are, you know, so, you know, it's an interesting thing. I guess the big distinction, I think, has to do with where people get scared, and, you know, and it, will, it has to do with something I would call artificial general intelligence, general artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. You know, what is good about a person is a person can do a broad range of things. And they can switch from one thing to another thing. And things that they learn from doing one task, they can carry on to another task. And this, this kind of general capability and understanding, we are, we are quite far away from. Yeah. So in specialized domains, particularly in perceptive type tasks, um, computers are very good and will we'll keep, you know, will get better so long, as long as the data keeps getting better. Um, the, the general, you know, uh, being able to do a variety of things or thinking at a, you know, at a higher, you know, at, at, at a larger scale level yeah. is still something that, uh, that, that would require artificial general, that general artificial intelligence, and that, that seems further away. Yeah, well, what's also hard about that is you don't have a, it's, it's hard to do something that's general because generally we don't all have a goal. Some days we just sit here and we, I don't know, like lounge about, we don't do much. The goal is changing all the time, you know, in terms of like humans. Whereas for something like reinforcement learning, you've got to be very specific with the goal you want it to do, you know, by setting so, up a reward system. So, so you know, may, may, maybe it's that. There, there seems to be, again, it would be, you know, somehow great if we could train a uh, computer to act as a graduate student and could kind of, uh, you know, go and, uh, you know, and, and you know, learn new areas, find things that are new, switch between tasks, you know, try to do different kinds of things. But, um, but this seems to be hard, uh, a, a substantially harder thing, that the techniques that people have been developing for machine learning don't, you know, are, aren't close to replicating the kind of flexibility that people have. Mm -hmm. And that... Um, you know, and, and so there, there is definitely a difference there. We, we, there's no real, they don't, they don't seem to be really ideas towards what I would call general intelligence that systems seem to be having. Mm -hmm. They're getting better and better at, um, you know, a range of different 
specialized tasks and yeah. perhaps they are getting better at um, you know generalizing some of them but it's still very much bottom up as opposed to general intelligence yeah. down because yeah what were you gonna say? so you generally can't program intellectual curiosity or anything like that because say you're you know looking at 15,000 images of um, people who have cancer like skin cancer right. so the uh, artificial intelligence can become better than, say, a human dermatologist at identifying those lesions bec before they become malignant. But it's not going to be able to be curious enough to, you know, discover why that these are occurring. You know, um, I, well, okay. So there are a couple of things. One is there's a okay. So there are a couple of different things. First of all, recognizing, um, you know, tissue biopsies and things like this mm -hmm. is cancerous, not cancerous. This is a perceptual test. You can have a lot of images of one type. You can have a lot of images of the other type. A, a, a machine learning system can figure out, you know, learn how to classify these things and does a pretty good thing. Now, it doesn't, a system like that doesn't know anything about the mechanism of cancer. Okay? It, it can't, it, it doesn't know what causes cancer. And if you have a pathologist, a pathologist knows a lot about the, you know, what causes cancer and why are you looking for this? Generally speaking, the, the machine learning systems now don't look for these kind of explanations in a way that they can explain. So one research area is trying to get AI that can explain itself. You'd like to not only say, I am 99% sure this, one, this, this tissue sample is cancerous, you'd like to explain, why, have it explain why. That's interesting. And that's something that would be a, is still, that, 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 that's a harder problem. That gets more at questions of cause mm -hmm. and effect and things like this. Do you, do you think it's going to be not one big system that performs like general intelligence, but a bunch of small subsystems that have machine learning that they've combined together? So like we have, so like why are, you know, we're interested in tasks like vision. We're interested in tasks like natural language, yeah. speech recognition. So all of these things individually, we seem to be able to now do well, right? Um, just because of all the computing power, you know, cloud computing seems to be going well. Yeah. But we can also then think about combining these things together into one. Well, object. okay, so that's an interesting question. The the you know, so first of all, we are quite far from artificial general intelligence, and I don't know anybody who's really w w would say that they are working on it. I think that there's there seem to be ideas, you know, that are, you know, we, 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 it's, it's not clear that we have ideas that would naturally lead itself to, to go working in that direction. Yeah. Okay. Now, you, one speculation might be you take a, a bunch of these more specialized systems and you stick them together like Frankenstein, you know, sew them up and you get a, uh, a general intelligence. My instinct is that there's something quite different. You know, you could imagine it, you know, it's it's not just that you can see and hear that makes you and you know your your intelligence. These are just inputs to it. Okay, it's kind of you know the the reasoning that you're doing, the 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 breadth of knowledge and the reasoning and these different concepts of categories and things like this. This stuff is, you know, it seems it, it seems like a, a different problem to try to design a system that is capable of, of thinking that way. Yeah. And so I, I, it, it, it's, it's not, you know, it's not obvious to me how we get to artificial general intelligence. It's not even obvious to me we eventually get to it, okay? Yeah. But, um, but if so, I doubt that we're going to get it by putting small pieces together. Do you, do you think we'll have to fully understand neuroscience and how our own brains work before we try to implement that? And so one, one, you know, path or idea that people sometimes think about, there are various research projects to try to, obviously neuroscience want to understand how the brain works, and uh, there are problems like the Human Connectome Project that try to really map what, yeah. you know, could, could you take somebody's brain and really map it down to the neuron level to the point that maybe you could simulate it or something like this, and then maybe, you, you know, my instinct is that that's, you know, so on one level, obviously we know what we think people think, so that, that, that would be, you know, if we, you know, that might be a path towards a human-like intelligence. Um, but it's also true that when it comes to building artificial systems, 
there's a limit to where it's helpful to um, what you call it, to uh, make anal natural analogies. When you wanted to build air, you know, planes, something that knew how to fly, you were interested in birds because they had wings and they were doing something. But you don't build bird airlines, planes that flap their wings. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that's, that's not the right way. There's better ways to get um, things to fly. Yeah. And so, you know, my, my gut feeling is that brains, brains are an amazing thing. They're a product of evolution. There's probably a lot that is involved with brains that helped it evolve that isn't necessarily kind of needed or the cleanest or the best way to do, so, to, you know, to, to do what, what, what they necessarily do. Yeah. So, um, but you, I mean, you could also make the same argument that we're not very good at that either. You know, we're always doing constant iteration on new, new projects to make it better. You know, we don't get it right the first time. But we figure out, and we're like, oh, I, saw, I see now how to, like, you know, make yeah, it better. Right. And one of the things I do think that could help is that in terms of if you're going to, like, map us onto some, let's say, technique that we have right now that's capable of doing things, such as reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is based on the reward that you give the agent after it does right. actions. So for us, we have a different reward system. And it's like everyone has a different reward. You know, everyone's yeah. after something different. And those are monitored by um, the neurotransmitters that are going through your brain. So everyone seems to have a different level of like, oh, well, when I do this task, like when I program, I'm, I'm happy. I, I like right, doing right. it, you know. So I'm more inclined to go in that direction and pursue those actions and build. So it seems like everyone has those reward systems. Now, why those reward systems are there aren't very clear. It's not very clear how you can specify a reward system right. in terms of neurotransmitters. Right. But I feel like that would be you know, the way. My, my AI Institute has, um, you know, faculty, uh, you know, like Memming Park who work in neuroscience. So clearly there is you know, interest in, in, in the neuroscience community and AI and vice versa. Yeah. Um, you know, the question of if you come back, you know, to what, ex to what is the extent to which intelligent systems that people build will mimic, um, you know, natural systems? That's hard to say. I mean, obviously, the, the main advances in machine learning recently have come through neural, neural networks. Mm -hmm. Neural networks are somewhat inspired, or were, were inspired by how brains work. But they work, you know, in many ways quite differently. So the, 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 there's, there's a limit to how deep the analogy is yeah. between how neural, neural networks work in a brain and how they work in a computer. Yeah. And so there's, a, there's a, certainly a superficial similarity, but not a very deep similarity. Well, yeah, because I would say that the difference is in those algorithms we have input and output. In terms of our brain, it feels like the, in, the output's going back into the input. And it's kind of like manifesting itself. Right, into right, right. Whereas right. that one's just like, put something in and something's going to come out. But that thing might not go back together. You know, unless you're talking about a different system. So now that we kind of like know, I guess, that general intelligence seems to be, you know, far off, what should we be worried about with AI? So, I mean, the, 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 the let's say, bigger, so, so again, you know, at some point, you know, certainly the advances in, in machine learning have been very dramatic lately. And if they kept continuing at the pace that they're continuing, you know, it'll be very interesting to see what happens. Um, you know, in, in the short term, the things that I would be more worried from a societal point of view have to do with um, things like how, to a certain extent, things like, you know, regulating who has access to data mm -hmm. for what purposes you know, because that's kind of fundamental to train these things. Yeah. And, and the other is kind of what in the way of vetting and responsibilities there are for models that you build. Yeah. So in other words, it is, it is obviously illegal if I, um, you know, for let's say if I were an employer to discriminate against a particular ethnic group. Mm -hmm. um, that would be obviously illegal. Now, what if I built a model that, that for some reason, the way it was based on the training data, didn't like one ethnic group? Yeah. Okay? Now, um, you know, so, so there are models that learn biases that are in data sets. 
And they are, I would say the concerns tend to be, I, in my mind, the bigger concerns are in how the models are used mm -hmm. more than, than, the, than the technology on these kind of things. One is that the models, sometimes people will treat the models with too much respect. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they'll defer decisions that should be made by people over to these models. Perhaps because these, you know, the models are it's cheaper to run them, or perhaps because they don't want a human liable, liable for these decisions or something like that. Yeah. And, and, and this, I think, is more problematic, is that often these models that people use are not as well validated as they should. They're usually often hidden behind trade secrets and things like that. And so I think the biggest question is, is what is it that we want out of these models mm -hmm. as a society, and how do we make sure that they are working for us you know, doing what we want them to do. Yeah, because I can t I can totally see that happening in terms of not only like, you know, college applications, um, you know, applications to jobs, where the, and and the hard part is, is you know, you want to just def the problem is you can't inspect every decision the model makes because then what was the point of building the model? Right. If it wasn't doing something automatic, but you know now. Like sort of like wage online, you have like all these applications coming, and it needs to get filtered out into a, like a, let's say a group of candidates that you can then go over individually and be right. like, this is enough for a human to handle. So right. after you filter it this much, you know, bring it in here. Should it do things like um, make a representative sample of candidates, you know, like from there, and maybe that's how it should do it. Yeah. It, it should be some sort of like handoff system. Well, you know, it depends upon what the, what the application is, but, but the, 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 the basic problem is it's very easy to hand off too much to, to, to the models. Mm -hmm. And I think that so one of the things that I would be concerned with is, you know, if I think, what, you know, as, as a society thing, is making sure we don't turn over. The models will always be cheaper to run than having a person. So there's a temptation to turn these things over. Um, but I think that, that, that it's necessary to, you know, to better understand why, you know, what, what, what problems are created by this. Mm -hmm. You know, one problem with models, good or bad, is if you have a model making a decision, it's hard to get anyone to listen to complain about it. Mm -hmm. So that uh, if, if, um, if my, you know, I, 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 a model is approving whether or not I get a loan, okay, yeah. Um, I, you know, if, if I am rejected because there was bad data given to the model, uh, yeah. there's no one for me to talk, talk to. Mm -hmm. If I was rejected because the model was trained to dislike people from my particular ethnic group, there's no one I can complain to. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and this is, this is in my mind, the bigger concern. It's clear that there's, there's incentive to turn these decisions over for cost. It's important that, that, you know, we as a society make sure we know what goals we want achieved and what force what what oversight is needed for these yeah i see that by one of the things like stipulated in the ai institute is that it's to look for like a symbiotic relationship right because i mean there's so there are, like like you said there's no there's problems going on with ai right now the one is like you said it's the discrimination right um i would say there's three there's this discrimination number two is unseen repercussions of a machine learning algorithm such as one would be Facebook videos um, right. they maximize for the time that people you know click on it and engage in it right it just so happens that the thing that makes people engage in it are videos that make them angry so the repercussion now is people are just going on Facebook well, you we're talking about angry. reinforcement learning you know part of the question is what are you optimizing for yeah if you are optimizing for viewer time, then that may be what, what you end up getting. Yeah. If you're optimizing to make the most money from advertising or something like that, you may get that. You know, it's important that somehow that, that the societal, you know, goods or objectives be, pa be part of the, the, yeah. the, the kind of objective in training or using these models. And that's kind of where I think the, 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 the hardest part is yeah. as far as, as far as, Society goes is a greater world where, where really the, the, the broader, broader incentives are understood. I just have one thing to say about the discrimination thing. Yeah. Because if the model is learning from what is latent 
in society, isn't that just bringing into greater focus, like, oh, we're the ones who are actually, like, um, creating all these, you know, biases, and the model is just learning from us. So in, if it turns out to be the case where it, it's making all these d discriminatory choices, isn't it kind of beneficial? Because now we can actually recognize that So the question, the question is, can you recognize it? You know, that somehow that, uh, you know, it's, it, it, you know, the models will spit out decisions. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, if you don't give any thought to why it's making its decisions or stuff like that, you may be very surprised when you see later on. But I mean, if, if, if your model is, let's say you're Amazon, and let's say you're making your hiring based on a, a let's say some kind of a resume screening program, it may take years till you, if, if you only look at the candidates you're seeing, it, you know, either the, the, the bias has to be very blatant or you need a lot of examples of it before you would really detect it. Yeah. You know, that, uh, and the reason I bring on Amazon, not, that, not to pick on Amazon, but, uh, you know, in, they, for example, tried to create a resume screening program. Um, and they were never really able to get it work because they couldn't get it unbiased. Okay, yeah. that that kind of training on the data of what um, you know what resumes they had seen and what you know because many of the resumes were you know you know were 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 made for example you know for for programming positions m many of the more of the applicants were male, mm -hmm. and that that started to make that look like. A desirable property mm -hmm. okay yeah. so again you know well-minded co companies are trying to do the and organizations are trying to do the right thing you know need if they can understand the models and they can evaluate them and they're keeping providing the proper oversight I do believe these kind of biases can be understood and corrected for and processed um, you know but you know, but, but it requires that oversight. And I, I do think it's easier to detect these biases in a model than in a, uh, in people. You're right, people probably have these biases. It's easier to detect it in a model in principle because it's making so many more decisions. Yeah. You may be horribly biased, but you're only going to hire 50 or 100 people when you're, you know, in, in, for your company. Yeah. If you have a model that's being used to screen millions of resumes, then then even more subtle biases should be detectable. Mm -hmm. They might be present, but in an ideal world, you have the statistical power potentially to correct, detect yeah. them, and correct for that. I mean, one of the problems I see, at least with that, is with black box models, it's hard to do inference on things to detect if they're like, let's say if there exists a bias, is it a negligible bias or, you know, like, is it um, significant? You know, it's hard to do statistical tests on that. Like, it's easy to do things like, let's say, you know, logistic regression or something like right, that. Right, right, those, right, right, right. But the, the inference goes down as you, you know, go into, like, deep learning. Well, okay, again, the, the, there's this question of understanding what the model's doing. I think that it is clear that, that in having a model, before you put it in practice, you should be doing a, you know, an auditing procedure where you are evaluating it for biases of a particular type, mm -hmm. okay? That, uh, you know, so you, you need to kind of check these things out. And, um, you know, and there's a lot, there's research, this is still a research question. This is one I am, you know, I'm optimistic that, that, that these things should be understandable. It's more like making sure that there's enough incentives that, uh, that you know, that organizations, you know, are strong, required to do the right thing. Yeah. And we slowly build up best practices for what that right thing is. Yeah. Um, oh, and, and back to the, the third problem I was going to say before, because I said the first two. The third problem was automation. Um, so replacing people and their tasks. One of the questions I have is in in the you know AI institute they want a more symbiotic relationship. It seems to be a goal. Right. Now, where would be the line of saying this can be automated? It's a task that we don't need to know how to do, or we can regain fast enough if we forget it. 
like one is driving a car. You know, um, they're trying to get trucks to be automated. Right. Because, and it makes sense to have trucks automated because these truck drivers are driving long hours, you know, sleep deprived. It's, it's a tough job. You know, but if you can get an AI that can just go all night, doesn't have regulations on it, that it has to sleep, you know, not only is it more profitable, but it's also better for the truck drivers because, you know, they get into accidents and stuff. But when you go into the medical industry, um, let's say you have things that can diagnose better than the doctors. Does that mean get rid of the doctors or like... Well, okay, first of all, I'm more worried about getting rid of the truck drivers for now as a shorter term thing. Again, we say, we say that... Or oh, wouldn't it be better for the truck drivers if they, you know, if they didn't have to drive trucks? Well, you know, to a certain extent, it, right now you have, I believe it's like 2 million people who are driving trucks and, and, and other vehicles employed. You know, that's, their, that's their employment. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is a big dislocation, economic dislocation, if these jobs go away. Yeah. And so, it's, so this is, this is an, a, a, an interesting and difficult question. You know, ever since the Industrial Revolution, people have constantly assumed that machines were going to take away um, employment and that, that uh, you know, the world was going to come to an end because there weren't going to be jobs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for the last 200 years, consistently as there have been new innovations, there have been new jobs to replace it, mm -hmm. you know, to, to make up for the losses. Um, and, and while certain, certain people were dislocated, it's certain, there's no question we today have a much more productive economy with a much higher standard of living than we ha did before, you know, at the, you know, at any time before this. Yeah. Now, the question is whether the AI revolution is something different, you know, kind of. Um, and this, this is hard to say. On one level, it feels different. You know, it does feel that these are intellectual, ta cognitive tasks that are being replaced yeah. and that we don't have much experience with that. On the other hand, for the last, you know, 200 years, people have been expecting, oh my God, now that we can do, the, you know, do this so much faster, why are we ever going to need people to work? Mm -hmm. You know, as of today, as we're speaking this thing, unemployment is very low in the United States. Okay, one hears that there are more jobs than there are positions. So it's hard, so, so it's hard to know how to square it. What I will say is, um, you, know, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a, sure I know where the jobs of the future are. Mm -hmm. I do think it's going to require, you know, wearing your tennis shoes and, and that the world is going to change and change rapidly. And people are going to be needed for that. Um, People seem to be needed for tasks that require some level of flexibility in doing different things. Mm -hmm. There is not this general, you know, general intelligence seems to be the hard thing to automate, not specialized things. And, you know, for things like, like for example, diagnosing biopsies. I'm not, pathologists are still going to be needed to interpret these. I have no doubt that you would like, you know, you know if, if you have your cancer you know, sample being read. You're going to need a doctor to interpret the results. You're going to need, um, you know, the best systems for, for reading radiological images. It's not people, it's not computers, it's people combined with computers. Those are the ones that seem to be most accurate. And, uh, you know, the, the, the answer, so hopefully, the, the, you know, there will be new jobs created. The jobs created certainly are going to involve interacting with more intelligent systems. Do you think that symbiosis could lead to people becoming less careful? Like, for example, when you're driving in a self-driving car, like right. you're not um, paying as close attention to the road as you would be if you were driving yourself. So in the case where a doctor is paired with a computer, would the doctor experience complacency? So, so certainly one thing that they have discovered, again, if you take a look at the Google self-driving car effort, from day one they felt, we are building a completely autonomous car. We want a car where people don't have a steering wheel. And the concern is exactly the one that you're mentioning. You don't want, um, you know, people to suddenly have to take over because they're not paying attention. And um, some of the other self, you know, automated driving companies this has been a problem, you know, the things that are on the road, because they will sometimes, you know, the people will not be paying attention. 
Now, I think that in most cases, what it, like the radiology problem, ideally you would have the radiologist be doing something different than the computer. So a typical thing might be the computer will say, huh, these are the regions I think are interesting. Radiologists look at them. And the radiologist will say, well, this doesn't look to me to be something to worry about. You know, but, but the goal is to try to minimize what the, the radiologist has to look at and maybe focus just on the regions or examples where it is most uncertain, where it is most high, high impact. Okay, so it would just eliminate most of the tedious work. So, so that, would be the, that would be the goal, a system that required the person to pay attention and even though most of the work is being done by somebody else, that, that you're right, that's, that's, that's doomed to failure because people will, will not pay attention. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that that's, in, in, in the primary use cases, I don't think that's really the, the yeah. number, what's going to happen. I, I think that in the truck example, you can't think of a way for truck drivers to be inserted in there. One is the fact that a lot of the time truck drivers are on large interstates. Now, for the large interstate, I can see the AI handling that fine. But when it becomes local and much more timely decisions have to be made, you know, you're on side streets, you're in suburbs, like, you know, there's lights, all of these things, and that becomes a little bit more complicated. So I can see AI playing a role and bringing them, you know, between destinations on the large part where you don't actually have to do anything. Because that's also where the part they fall asleep. You know, you're driving yeah. on... You know, this yeah. you know, of course, the other question, again, but, but when you think about, let's say, some of the way, like, like, like these self-driving cars are being built, any reasonable self-driving car will have a mode where if it gets into trouble, it will go to a remote driver. So you could imagine, I mean, again, why do you need the truck driver on the truck yeah. if 90% of the time he's going to be sleeping? You know, what you probably want is a, is a self-driving truck that's going to, you know, be able to do its thing. But if it gets in trouble, it will be able to call to, you know, to call to some remote driver who's piloting. Like, like you, you know, like you have drones that are being piloted yeah. by, 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 by people. That'd be a weird thing if I'm just sitting at a light and I just see a truck pull up next to me and there's like nobody in it. Oh, well, it'll be weird. It'll be weird. It'll be weird till you till it's not weird. Yeah. I mean, you know, presumably the the cab won't won't you know won't look what, with enough time. The cab if there's not going to be drivers in it, then frankly, it's not going to have a cab. Yeah. Okay. And so I don't I don't doubt that it's going to look different with would, time. Would it, would it be safer? If they were all autonomous and they all knew where each other were? So, yeah. So, obviously, um, the more information these cars have, the better. And if, if there was a central coordinating thing, if they communicated with each other, that would be helpful. Now, the question is whether it's necessary. And, you know, as far as I know, they're making st quite steady progress towards self-driving vehicles. Um, you know, the people I know who work on this say, you know, certain things are going to be harder than the public kind of appreciates. But, um, but you know, in Arizona, you have the equivalent of like an Uber or a Lyft being done in a, in a self-driving way. They have a driver there, I think, just for legal requirements. Really? But, but um, you know, but... Yeah, again, there's special cases. A lot of things that are good about Arizona. Arizona, you don't have snow. Mm -hmm. So the weather conditions, it, it gets much harder with different weather conditions. It's, a, it's a, a finite area. So you have it completely mapped out, you know, on a regular basis. Okay, so it's an area that you know very well. So that's an example of a viable product, you know, kind of that. But, but it's, still, it's still more restricted. Mm -hmm. But I do picture that gradually what these will do is more and more and more until, you know, you basically, you know, you, it's basically taken over driving for, you know, r routine things that you have. And that less and less is going full back yeah. to the person, you know, being radioed back, the drone controller who, who deals with when they're, when they're in trouble. Yeah. Another thing that I, that I see as potentially being a problem is the rate at which 
we can fake things with AI. You know, um, have you ever seen the thing where called uh, deep fake? Yeah, so yeah, I'm a, I'm familiar with this. Yeah, so so you have that thing simulating the speech, and you can tell that it's not real, but you can tell it's getting pretty close. Right. And on the other side of that, it's kind of like, um, in you know, computer science where you have white hats and black hats. It's like, okay, how do you detect the fake? And then it's right. like, oh, well, now they can detect me. So how can I now make it such that they can't detect me? It's like this adversarial, right. um, you know, network problem. So how much is that going to be a problem? in terms of stirring up the public, because if they're putting out these fake things and people don't look at it close enough, or they just see a clip on and on a news line and be like, oh, this person said this. You know, my, my instinct, first of all, is that you're right. Again, these, these so-called generous, generative adversarial networks, these GANs, are getting very, very good at synthesizing images and videos, and they're really kind of amazing things that can be done. Um, now, how will the public deal with this? What I suspect is, you know, Again, you guys are young, but at one point there was, you know, when I, after I, I've been at, well, you know, I, I'd been at Stony Brook when suddenly the problem of spam in email became a problem. Mm -hmm. And you had all these people sending fake emails, essentially, hoping to get your attention. Mm -hmm. And spam is now, it's, it's sort of at the time was an equally difficult problem. I mean, my, my email would be half the email I got was spam. It was making email unusable. Yeah. But somehow, um, spam has got, detection has gotten pretty good, okay? It's not a big problem in the email that I read these days. Yeah. And, you know, how was that beaten down? Well, some of it was machine learning. Spam filters for, you know, are definitely based on machine learning at these companies. Part of it is also about things like provenance, meaning where does your, the information come from? So, you know, if... Uh, you know, if, you, if you're getting mail from that, that really comes from uh, someone that you, you've corresponded with in the past, it's mm -hmm. probably a good piece of mail. Yeah. Where if it's coming from some strange site that has never sent any good mail, mm -hmm. then that's probably... So, likewise, with, what I suspect is going to happen is, in this campaign, there will be kind of more faking of stuff. I think there will be gradually fairly quickly a recognition that, that, that the things that are fake are fake. So like, for example, there's, there's this video with Nancy Pelosi, supposedly drunk, okay? And this was detected, you know, got circulated, but frankly, um, pretty clearly, it, it, was, it was clear it was a fake. Yeah. And I think that gradually this will, you know, as people get exposed to more and more of these things, they will learn they cannot trust a um, piece of video without knowing where it comes from. Yeah. Okay, and, uh, and, and that I think is going to be ultimately what a lot of it is going to be is where does it come from? There's going to probably have to be, you know, cryptographic evidence that you can prove that, 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 that this video came from somebody's camera, you know. But I think that the days of, oh, look, here's a picture of, you know, Donald Trump taking a bribe, okay? This quite, you know, if, if you're just saying, where did it come from? Oh, I don't know, okay? That's probably not going to be acceptable mm -hmm. evidence. You know, ideally, if it's video, it was filmed someplace, okay? You know, there was someone who did it. You know, you need to have this kind of provenance in order to... So, I don't think it's going to be a purely algorithmic thing that you're going to be able to tell fake, not fake, too. But I do think that there's going to need to be greater scrutiny yeah. of this. I mean, because I could see someone setting up, setting up a, a website such that people would go on and say whether or not it was fake. And in that case, we become the network, uh, well, the, the, detect, the detector teaching it how yeah. to make it better. You know, yeah. Because we're very good at detecting fakes. Even well, we're not so good at detecting fake. I mean, we're, we're not so good at detecting. There are a lot of people think Nancy Pelosi is a drunk because they saw this, this, this horrible video. So it's not clear to me that, um, that people are that good at it. But it is clear that if this is an important problem to solve, which I think it's going to be, uh -huh. um, you know, there are going to be ways to deal with it probably analogous to um, what was done with, you know, and I think that the way spam has been dealt with 
is ideally going to be a model for this. Yeah. It seems to me that this main solution that you said is that the public has to be more skeptical of what they see. Right. But I just feel like that's going to create much more distrust mm -hmm. that the public has in you know, everything that they come across, be it on social media or even on news media. Right. And so is, is that a good thing? This is a big societal question. I mean, I do think that, um, you know, again, I am a firm believer. I read my newspaper every day. I subscribe to The Economist, you know, which is a, 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 you know, a news magazine. I do think that getting news from trusted sources is an important part of the, the story. Sources are an important part of the thing. And, you know, part of, I gather, the social media world is that any, anybody is a source. And I think that, that, that at, at the heart, it's a question of who do you trust and that, you know, we do have to be, be, become less trusting. Mm -hmm. We'll be less trusting, I think, of the, of the world at large, but, but more trusting of, you know, I will say, you know, certain organizations and, uh, you know, that are authorities. I think that, that we need to be, you know, less suspicious of, you know, they, 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 there's a certain level of reflex um, not trusting of things on, 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 on certain sources. And I, 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 guess, I guess somehow we... The, the, you know, maybe I'm just rambling here, but I mean, I guess it's kind of important that, that, that we live in a world where, where there are sources that we feel we can trust. Mm -hmm. I do feel I can generally trust the New York Times, okay? Um, I do feel I can generally trust The Economist. Generally does not mean always, but I do mean that there's a good faith effort mm -hmm. that when there is, uh, you know, I can trust, the, I feel I can trust The Washington Post. Okay, that there's a good faith effort to try to get at the truth. Doesn't mean you're going to bat 100%, but it does mean that, 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 that they are trying to, you know, to validate these, these things. Yeah, I mean, I've seen, well, one of the things with, with news sources, I've just gotten much, much less trustful of them because I feel like they've been becoming more clickbaity. You know, they're making it more exaggerated because it's like, like, it's like they're waving their hands like, oh, well, yeah, one thing, if, here, again, you know, if I have to take it, crazy. one thing is that in order to get good information, you have to pay for it. And this is something that, um, that I think that the, you know, it, is, is kind of an important thing. We have gotten in a world where, to a certain extent, because there's an internet economy supported by advertising and clicks in some sense, the trouble is it's, it's, it's hard for you know, getting good information and vet vetting these things costs money. Mm -hmm. And I do think that, that, that a lot of it is an economic problem, more than, you know, m most of all. If people won't pay for it, then all you're going to get is, and if people are satisfied with the, you know, the, um, you know, clickbaity stuff, yeah, then that's what you're going to get. I mean, I, I think that the new, the new spam of, like, this generation would be fake social media accounts. And that's that's extremely hard to combat because you know, you can you, you can open up an account and it's like I don't know, let's just say like you don't use it or you post like a picture, I don't know, every every week or something like there's you know, there's you, ways that you, they like mess with it, but they but they act like real users some of them because the the whole thing with um Russia, those people, they were acting like real users. But they were fake in the sense that they weren't on there to generally be right. part of Facebook and the community. Right. So creating algorithms to detect when people are just trying to... Well, people mess, certainly, mess certainly all the major internet problem platforms have algorithms to try to detect what are fake accounts. You know, and they undoubtedly... But the problem is, of course, that they, these, these, it's, you, know, you have programs... It's not a person generating the fake account. You have programs generating these fake accounts and you can generate rate you know thousands or millions of them and it's hard to catch all of them you know I, I, as I understand um, you know Twitter or, or these things you hear them take down millions of accounts but it, that means that people are creating millions of accounts so if you get 90 percent of them if it's not too expensive you you know you're still going to have millions of fake accounts out there mm -hmm. you know the um, 
Part of it is, is a question of, again, what is the level of identity that you need? If, it, you know, there's not a problem so much with fake students registering at Stony Brook. They're always, you know, everyone at, the, at Stony Brook here is a real person in a real account, and why is there not a problem of fake accounts being created? The reason is because it comes, you know, you have to be admitted. It's inspected carefully before you're admitted, mm -hmm. and there, there is a cost associated with it. Yeah. And so part of me says that, um, you know, again, a, a lot of these problems, I think, do reduce to economic questions of, you know, if it's important enough, society views it as important enough to stop these things, then they can be stopped through economic models. Mm -hmm. If you had to pay, you know, um, you know, ten dollars a month for for access to your social media account, that seems not an unreasonable thing. Suddenly, nobody can create a million of these accounts so much because they are they are expensive, right? Yeah. And suddenly, um, you you know you you can you know presumably this is being linked to something like a credit card or something like that. You you can tell if if two accounts are being bought off the same credit card or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so a lot of these things I think reduce the problems reduced to the economic incentives. How important is it to stop this problem? Mm -hmm. And you know if people are willing to pay for it, the problems can be stopped. Mm -hmm. And that and or if the laws insist that you know that that this be stopped, the problems mm -hmm. can be stopped. Yeah. Um, do you think that later down the line, I, you know, I feel like relatively, relatively soon, you know, they put in obvious, obviously practices for mechanical engineers and electrical engineers of things they need to show that they're capable of doing before that they can sign off on something being built, right? Because a lot of things are at stake if they build something that's right, right, right. bad. Is there going to be something similar in terms of data science? You know, a lot of, a lot of let's say, what, what people worry about with data science are un, unforeseen kinds of problems, okay? And so, um, you know, the problem of, for example, models that discriminate based on biases, no one thought that was very important for a while. Now, you know, anybody building this, mo you know, models it's fair for them to know that this is a potential problem and it's something they got to think about and they've got to try to mitigate. Um, you know, a lot of the problems with the modern world are kind of unforeseeable, seen things, that it's, it's, it's less fair to say someone, darn it, you should have known. Mark Zuckerberg should not have known in advance that uh, when he was sitting in his dorm room at Harvard, that damn it, if you put this thing together, there's going to be Russians hacking an election. Okay. That's not a fair to ask. It is fair to ask, you know, you are a, you know, a very profitable company. It is clear that uh, there are, uh, are other models, econ economic models that would help cut down some of these problems. Mm -hmm. Okay? And that, 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 that maybe we need to change your business model. Okay? In order to, uh, I have to believe that the Facebook or Instagram is worth the hundred dollars a year to people, okay? Um, you know, or make it, maybe it's fifty dollars a year or something like this, um, and that the world might be a better place if they shift to different models, or if if you know if not, then they have to ensure you know greater accuracy and things like that. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting because it's always held as like a democratizing thing like Facebook, Instagram, like you, anybody can get on it as long as they have access to the internet. But because of the fear that AI is presenting, we're kind of undermining the democratization by making it such that you have to have a credit card now in order to get onto it. You have to pay. Well, it's, you know, it's, okay, so there are a couple things. First of all, some of this is AI, some of this isn't AI. Mm -hmm. You could, you know, you could... It's not clear to me that North Korea is a big AI place. It is seemed to me that North Korea has plenty of hackers who are sitting in bunkers trying to break into accounts and things like that. So it's not completely an AI problem. It's sort of a broader connected technology kind of problem. 
you know, when we're in a world where there are these giant systems, they are all going to be giant targets. Um, and, you know, so, so it's something that one has to worry about. But, um, you know, but what's democratizing, what isn't democratizing is, you know, is, is, is a philosophical thing. You know, it's clear that unlimited freedom of speech is not completely the democratizing thing. You know, that, that you know you were never allowed to yell fire in a crowded theater. This was sort of a bad thing. And so likewise, you know, what is the right level of, you know, free speech and, you know, connectivity, you know, in a, you know, a, a world of today? This is something that, that, that a society needs to work out. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there are like multiple ways to guarantee, and I wouldn't say guarantee, but definitely get someone's identification, like me getting like my coin, Coinbase account. Um, you have to give like three levels of things to get in there. It's like you need to do confirmation by email, text messaging, like two-factor authentication, yeah. sending pictures of your ID, linking a, linking a card to it. Right. It's like you have to do so much stuff, and then it like waits like a week. You like, can't do anything. You're capable of doing anything on it. You know, right. that period of time. But I would say that's a very good way of not... <laughs> well, that, that is, systems like that are required for dealing with money, okay? Because that, that, that has value and stuff like that. Yeah. The presumption had kind of been that, oh, gee, the social media was, you know, lightweight enough, unimportant enough, that there's no reason not to give somebody a, a, a random account just for asking, okay? And maybe... You know, maybe 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 there are more costs associated with this than you know that that than we saw saw at first. Mm -hmm. Another another thing. This may be a little bit more off topic, but it was something that yeah. interested me about your book. Um, it was this one part. I think it was in like chapter six. It had to do with data visualization. And I've always looked at different articles because, uh, you know, you see things that come up from the New York Times like, oh, new study says this, blah, 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 says this. Blah, right, says right, this. right. And you look at the figures and they're completely like blown up in different ways to accentuate these differences, really playing on what your eye sees and not right. what the actual data says. And how much of a problem do you think that that is? Right now. Well, like again, part of it, we're talking here about AI and machine learning. These are computers doing the work. Ultimately, for making decisions, it should be people interpreting mm -hmm. the data. And that's where visualization becomes an important thing. Because in order to look at a complex data set and see what it's really saying, you know, if you do the visualization badly, you will not learn what the right thing that the data is saying. Mm -hmm. And a lot of, so there is an aesthetic in mathematical graphics that, uh, you know, that, that, that if people understand, you know, you know, you know there, there's certain kind of implicit assumptions that you have when looking at an image that help you interpret it, that if you don't keep these, you know, adhere to these kind of standards, okay, it's very hard to interpret. As an example of what he's talking about is, um, you know, if I have a graph, you know, you guys are familiar with graphs, we have an x-axis and a y-axis. You know, if, if I wanted to um, show a particular, so let, let's say I wanted to, sh let's say that, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking at life expectancy, okay, and, and this may be not a good thing. Life expectancy is the y variable. X is maybe the amount of money that they're making. You know, you want the graph to show the whole range of people, so you don't want to cut off at a particular. You know, you you want to make sure that 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 that, that you're showing the, the the full data range, mm -hmm. and you want to make sure that 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 people can interpret what's really there. That was probably not a great example, but but it is clear that 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 when it comes to data visualization, it's it's important to produce graphs that that actually show the. Um, the, you know, the effect that people see is really the effect that's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there are many ways of lying with graphics and things like that. And that's one of the things I try to educate people about in my class. Yeah, like if you have a range of something like, you know, from zero to one, and it's like, you know, a difference of 0.1 isn't that much, but in pixels, maybe a difference of 0.1 is like, you know... Like from right. here to like up here. Right. This is a, this is this is a conversation better had with pictures in front of us. Yes. But uh, okay. but uh, so I recommend you go 
But you know, if you're out there, the first thing you should do is try to buy my book, okay? <laughs> Skeena's The Data Science Design Manual, um, sold at Amazon and other fine bookstores, okay? And you'll learn a lot. Yeah. Um, another, another place that I think is an issue is military. Because um, that's, that's, a, that's a different one from all this, you know, online and getting to the getting to the internet and using that to play against people, but this one's much more physical. And what should be, like one of the things I've been thinking of was, instead of like a nuclear bomb going off and, you know, killing a whole load of people and, you know, making the atmosphere horrible, you know, making everything bad, and you could make, you could theoretically make a system that is much more efficient at, you know, doing damage and minimizing damage to the environment and it's like that's something we should be watching out for well so the question of ai in the military there's all kinds of interesting you know and important issues there that come on i mean on on one hand as your weapons get smarter you should be able to minimize collateral damage that's kind of what you're you're talking about yeah okay that that uh you know they have these drones that uh you know are able to really target who they are interested in in killing or taking out, and you can kind of bomb a vehicle instead of bombing a town. Yeah. Okay, so that's minimizing collateral damage. There's a separate question of who makes these decisions. Mm -hmm. You would like this to be, you know, it seems to me that you'd like kill, you know, any kind of a military thing where you're actually going to kill someone or injure someone. This should be made by a commander. This should be made by an individual. Okay, who's been trained to have rules of engagement and stuff like that. It's a different question to imagine a system that is controlling weapons that is now purely under the under the control of an algorithm. Mm -hmm. And this this is this is a more you know a a a you know a a a thing that seems re reasonable to be concerned about. Yeah. On one hand, it seems it, it's you know. It seems bad to to give these decisions to computer systems and not people. Okay, um, you know, perhaps you could imagine providing more information to people to make these decisions. That yeah. seems like the better operant. But but yeah, but there are concerns of whether just the speed as technology increases, whether the speed of battlefield decisions requires turning them over to computers, yeah. and this then becomes you know uh, you know. It is is a, is a scary world. War is always a scary world, but this is a new dimension of scariness. Yeah, because I mean, part of the problem is not only like, all right, you know, we could be looking over at what we're making and say whether it's ethical or not, but then you look over there at some other country and you're like, well, I mean, that's not ethical, but they're doing it. You know, they're making it anyway. Right. It's like, what do we do now? So there are there there is some question of again, if if other countries are doing it. Um, do we need this in order to compete? So anyway, so these, these are complicated issues. But again, these, these become societal control issues. That's what I think most of this comes down to. I think society has to figure out what it values and how it tries to make these decisions. Yeah, I mean, part of the problem with that is also I don't think people are as informed. Because if, if you watch the Mark Zuckerberg thing with, um, you know, at the Senate, I don't, I don't think they knew what they were talking about at all. And they had people next to them that like knew what they were talking about, but I don't know. They were asking questions that it was like, "Why are you asking those questions? That's that's not a good question." Right, right, you know, right. They were like kind of like, like trying to grill him, but I don't think they did anything. It was one, just the, I remember right. one of the questions was like, uh, "The messages are encrypted, but what does that mean? <laughs> what is the definition of encrypted?" Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah you don't need. You don't need. You don't need that. They're like, he's like, "That's not what I asked. What I asked was." <laughs> Can I get access to the to the messages that happen in WhatsApp? And he's like, No, sir. Well, no. And he's like, They're encrypted. It's like, You're not answering my question. Yeah. <laughs> he just kept going on. He, was, he didn't know the definite. He didn't know what encrypted meant. Right, right, right. So they just right, kept asking right. these questions. But now we're asking these people to make decisions about systems that they don't understand. Well, the world is a complicated place. It has always been a complicated place. It will probably be getting more complicated. It always gets more complicated. Also. But you know, you know. Ideally, you elect representatives that that try to understand. You know, 
That's why I think it's important to have a broad background in, of knowledge for people rather yeah. than being specialized in a particular area because the world throws a lot of things at you. And maybe, again, maybe if we talk about it, it does seem like artificial general intelligence is harder than specialized things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's why I guess, I, you know, it's important to learn about lots of different things. It's a, if you're a senator, you should know something about encryption. Yeah, I saw one of the things you had on your page was uh, the quant shop. What's, what's that about? So when I taught my data science class, one year I, um, I gave students cameras. Again, part of the course assignment was that they had to do a project building a model to make a prediction. Uh -huh. And so I gave each team a different predicting task, and I gave them a camera. And I told them, make your model, but film yourself doing it at various points. And we edited this thing into programs. So like one predictive task was, how would you predict the weight of a baby? Uh -huh. Okay, at birth, okay? And um, they, you know, they had to go and build a model that took variables and made predictions. And then we had a particular mother who was pregnant and uh, who was timed to give birth at the end of the semester. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they had to they had to pick uh, pick pick what that kid's weight was, and uh, you know so that was so anyway so so we edited these shows and uh, I I use them I describe them in my my data science book the data science design manual <laughs> Springer Verlag uh, available on Amazon and uh, you know and you can also watch these videos uh, they're on they're on Vim, uh, Vimo but uh, you can watch them from my uh, yeah. I, I like the way you did the book because I, I, there's a lot of books out there that are technical, very, very technical. And while I like those, I do like ones that give me the conceptual flow diagram of the questions I should be asking at right. each step of, you know, some project. And I think it like, it really, it really gets down into that and like, you know, what you should do yeah. and also good practices too. With a lot of, with a lot of things, it's important to develop an intuition about it. And a lot of times, as you know, in technical materials, it's hard to to get the intuition behind it. You know, the technology, the technical aspects are hard. And so, yeah. So when I, when I when I write a book like that or my algorithms book, I do try to concentrate a lot on intuition, yeah. developing intuition, because that's kind of I think is important for reasoning about these yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. Like I took a look at a few snippets, and I'm not in this field at all. But just the intros, you make them very accessible. Like, um, I remember you included an anecdote about, like, Tanya Harding uh, right. for Chapter 6 or something. I didn't understand, like, the like the mathematics, but I understood what I was supposed to be getting at. You oh, know? okay. Like, oh, like, things aren't always as they seem. Like, they're, they're things you should dive deeper into. And I thought right, that was right. Nice. Anyway, I try to make the book so people, want, you know, it's readable so people want to read it. Yeah, the war stories are good, too. Is that also in, like, the... Yeah, I, and that's also in my algorithms book. These stories are these are stories of applications and things that I worked on, where the material came up, yeah. and so you know it gives sort of you know a you know the kind of what are the lessons you learn from doing this kind of stuff in practice. Yeah, and I think that's also helpful to build intuition. Yeah, no, I definitely enjoyed those because a lot of the times I, you do see um, books, but you don't see you, you like that's the experience. The, you know, those those parts of the chapters, that's the experience that it's like, oh, well, why was this chapter here? And I was like, oh, well, look at this. This is something right. that actually happened to me yeah. and why I'm putting these things in this chapter. So, yeah, that was really, really well written. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so you want to wrap it up? Yeah. Well, thank you. See okay. You it's been fun talking to you on. guys and, uh, and good luck with this. Thank you. Remember, everyone, data science design manual. Data science design manual, the algorithm design manual, calculated bets. Okay, lots of good books out there. All right. Take care. Thanks. Good luck. <laughs>